We are hoping to maintain a credible deterrence in the Taiwan Strait by you know, strengthening or increasing our deterrence capabilities, by showing the world that we are going to fight uh, to the end of everything. So it's very important to show the will to fight and the capability to fight. Stephen, is a threat imminent? Um, I think uh, China has made it very clear that they want to take over Taiwan. So, you know, it could be any, it could be any minute, it could be any day. Welcome everyone, I'm Catherine Liu and you're watching Taiwan Plus Point. We all know that geography has made us neighbors, economics has made us partners, but necessity made us allies. From Biden administration into Pacific strategy to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, to looking to Asian countries' new leadership, including South Korea and Philippines, these international events all intertwine together. Today, I have two frontline experts to talk about from a geopolitics point of view, can it all tilt it to Taiwan's vintage? I'm very happy to introduce my guest today, Dr. Luo. Uh, who is a legislator and also the co-chair of Foreign Affairs and National Defense Committee. You've been involved in international relationship professionally for more than 20 years. So happy to have you on our show. And also, also Mr. Stephen Tang, uh, who is the managing director of International Policy Advisory Group, who run offices both here and in New York. I guess my very first general question is, just on this March, Mike Mullen was here. He is the former chairman of Joint Chief of Staff under President George W. Bush and as well Barack Obama. And Mike Pompeo was here. He was a former Secretary of State. And as if this delegation not big enough, uh, Nancy Pelosi, sitting Speaker of the House, scheduled to visit Taiwan. Uh, Dr. Luo, have you ever seen this? What does it say about Taiwan? I think we are very happy to see uh, so many high-level officials coming to Taiwan. Um, but I think the timing is very important mm -hmm. because the war in Ukraine, uh, some people in, the, in, the, in, the, in this region have questioned the, uh, the credibility of the U.S. commitment to the security in the region. So the visit by those people, high-level officials from the states, uh, highlight the importance of Taiwan, but more importantly, demonstrate the U.S. commitment to the security in the region. So that is a very important signal uh, sent by the White House to the you know, countries in the region. But the frequency and the numbers of the delegation, have you ever seen this before in other timing? Uh, no, that's why we think that it's a very important development uh, in our bilateral relations with the U.S. But more importantly, uh, that suggests the U.S. commitment to the security in the region. But more importantly, that demonstrates the strategic posture of the U.S. in the region. I see. See, I'm very curious. Every time when such behavior or such event happened, China condemns such behavior and saying they will have some sort of countermeasure. Uh, why do you think uh, United States knows everything about China's uh, reaction? They still want to send delegation coming here. Well, no doubt about that, Kathleen. Uh, Taiwan is center of gravity. Well, uh, so I would be surprised if there's no high-level delegations from Japan, from the United States, and from Europe coming to Taiwan. In the past, the only reason that we don't see lots of high-level delegations from all over the place is China. But, but it's mm -hmm. been changing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, people around the world now realize that Taiwan is not only strategically important to the rest of the world, but Taiwan represents the core value that's cherished by the international community which is freedom, which is the democratic value of life, which is our rule-based, constitutional-based governance. And the, of, of all those things that will give us the ultimate leverage and also the highest visibility. So I'm not surprised that you will see the more high-level delegations uh, coming over to Taiwan, not just to strengthen the support, mm. but also to see by themselves the vivid democracy and how we are on the front line mm. against China and how we are prepared for all those uncertainties and what's coming up to us. You see, the, you see what's happening in Ukraine and they give, this gives a lot of enlightenment to the people in Taiwan and also around the world. So China's not happy for sure, but nothing's gonna make China happy. So by sending the delegations to Taiwan, China will be very furious, but, mm. but this is not what we care about. I, I think the international communities now know that by supporting Taiwan, 
by witnessing what's happening in Taiwan, the vivid development of the democracies in Taiwan, and this seems to be the only way going forward. Mm, I specifically digged out uh, my Mullen speech uh, delivered to President Tsai Ing-wen this time. And he mentioned several times that we need peace and stability that keep coming out. And also saying Taiwan uh, or democracy needs a champion. And he said Taiwan is the right example for democracy. Why do you think he is repeatedly stressed this and want to make a point? We are seeing a very big shift in terms of balance of power in the region. And China has becoming more and more aggressive, you know, in many ways. And China's activity, military activities in the region has been threatening to many neighboring countries. So it's very important to show that all those countries neighboring China are unified uh, in, in defending our democracy. And Taiwan is standing at the forefront of a fight between democracy and autocracy. So the, the, the importance of Taiwan is very vivid, as mentioned by uh, Dr. Tan. Uh, in terms of uh, its geostrategic, strategic, geopolitical, uh, geoeconomic, and even geotechnological uh, position. So uh, with this rising power of China, a uh, rising Chinese threat to the region, the importance of Taiwan has been risen. I see. But would you afraid, okay, increasing the visibility, yes. But does it at the same time also rise the danger level or the tension around the globe in Taiwan Strait area? Do you fear for that? Um, Taiwan has been the hotspot geopolitically and China has been vowing to take over Taiwan, no doubt about that. I don't see the, I don't see the international space on one hand and also the geopolitical risk on the other. I don't, I don't see it's binary, you know, they, those are separate from each other. While we're striving for the international space for Taiwan, we're, while we're enhancing the visibility in Taiwan, China will continue to threaten to take over Taiwan with or without Taiwan, you know, getting more international space. So I'm not concerned about um, the enhancing the uh, geopolitical risk here in Taiwan by having more visibilities and more delegations and more high level political leaders from around the world coming to Taiwan. Do you agree, Dr. Lo? No Absolutely. gender? You know, because there's no way that we can make China happy. You know, China is a power that is challenging the status quo. China has never been happy or pleased or satisfied with the status quo. They are trying to challenge, change the status quo. And so the status quo means peace and stability. And Taiwan is very important in terms of maintaining that kind of balance of power in the region. More importantly, uh, maintaining the peace and stability in the region. And China is the country who has been trying to upset or at least undermine uh, the peace and stability in the region. I see. Now let's move to another topic. Stephen, we've seen so many new allies these days, maybe Quad, Quad Plus, AUKUS, or as opposed to Asian Pacific, Asian Pacific strategy, now we see Indo Pacific strategy. Uh, what does the all mean for Taiwan and what is Taiwan situated in these new allies formation? Okay. Uh Kathleen, it is my understanding that the Biden administration has made very clear that in the Indo-Pacific, it would be not like a NATO, which is a fixed organization with a secretariat and all that. It would be a loosely organized alliances, such as, as you mentioned, uh, AUKUS, such as Quad. But Quad is composed of uh, the United States, uh, Australia, India, and Japan. But it's expandable. It, it can be... Quad Plus, it can include South Korea, it could even possibly include Taiwan or the Philippines. So the, the overall idea, I, if I understand correctly, Kathleen, the, yes. the, the, the um, Indo-Pacific strategy of the United States is it, really try to uh, put together the like-minded countries uh, and then to come up with the core value, both in terms of the military and defense and in terms of the political and the economic and even technological um, aspects uh, and, and to put, put forward a sort of a core uh, group. Uh, so in that space, I think a lot, there's a lot of things that Taiwan can do by way of continuing to participate in the, the, the Indo-Pacific strategy of the United States, but not just the United States. You know, you know that EU countries and yes. EU itself will also have their own respective Indo-Pacific strategies. But also in terms of the continuing uh, to discuss within each and every uh, 
quad country and also quad itself, as I just mentioned, the quad plus or plus plus. And we, we have a lot to contribute. As I mentioned earlier, Taiwan has been long recognized as a leading democracy in Asia. Yes. And, um, and our core value, which is the freedom in the rule-based democracy, has long been recognized and appreciated and cherished by the international communities. So the, the whole Indo-Pacific involvement by the United States and the European countries and EU itself have provided a golden opportunity for us to contribute, not just to get from the international community, but contribute our strength. Um, to the international society. And so what's been going on in, in the Quad, uh, I, I think it's very interesting and uh, there's a lot to see. And I'm sure that uh, Dr. Lowe has a lot of insight where we can uh, uh, further uh, enroll in, in those uh, loosely organized international alliances. Dr. Lowe, yes. Well, unfortunately, we don't have an Asian version of NATO, but uh, we are facing similar challenges uh, in the region. Uh, re that requires so, sort of a, a international cooperation, especially in the face of a rising China. So uh, the U.S. has been trying to work out with different types of uh, alliance system. You know, it's not all together, you know, putting one alliance system, but the several tiers of cooperation, dialogue, you know, uh, security framework, or even uh, this kind of defense uh, 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 alliance. Stephen said it's loosely organized. Do you think it means uh, the political connotation is not as serious as, for example, NATO or other long-established uh, international organizations. It's loose in some way, but it's very rigid in the other way. For instance, you do have bilateral alliance system between the U.S. and Japan, bilateral uh, defense system between the U.S. and uh, South Korea. So you do have that kind of alliance cooperation. But on the other hand, you don't have an overall you know, uh, Indo-Pacific alliance system in the face of a threat from China. So it's very important for us to have this kind of coordination among different systems. And that's the reason why uh, you have this kind of AUKUS, bringing the UK into the game. You have Quad, bring, Indo, uh, in, bring India into this kind of uh, uh, trilateral, you know, uh, multilateral dialogues. Right. So I think the US has, knows the difficulties of having a, you know, a grand design uh, of alliance system. But, so that's the reason why the US has been trying to uh, uh, to deal with the problem in a more bilateral, you know, mini uh, trilateral way. What would you say the goal for these organizations that the United States wants to achieve? Well, the goal is very obvious. That is, we have, we have to cope with the threat from China. 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 Just to China? Yeah, because all the countries work together because they have two important principles. One is national interest. And all, the, all those countries are in favor of status quo, meaning a free and open Indo-Pacific. That's uh, has to do with their national interest. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, they also share uh, you know, universal values, mm -hmm. democracy, rule of law, human rights, and so on. So these are two major pillars uh, to their cooperation. But also, uh, they realize that we are facing a threat from authoritarian regime. China is trying to upset and change the status quo. I see, Stephen. Just to China forming so many new allies, what do you think China's response or countermeasures to these new uh, strategy, and especially toward Taiwan? Well, I think uh, China is very clear that you know all the regional alliances, uh, you know, are basically facing uh, China as the competitive uh, threat uh, or, or the strategic competitor. Now, the United States has developed a very clear strategy um, that, uh, you know, to, uh, to work with China uh, uh, only on the common interest. But if there is a need to compete uh, or contend, and the United States, uh, to my understanding, is not shy away from competing against China or, you know, having a direct confrontation uh, with China in this region and beyond. Mm. The, Various different countries have their respective national interests, as Dr. Lowe just correctly pointed out. Uh, our national interest is to preserve the status quo, our integrity, democracy, freedom of speech, and our constitutional right, and our prosperity. Yes. And, um, but unfortunately, we have, we have a neighbor that's not too far away from us that's trying to um, invade us or, or, or coerce uh, to, to ask us to be part of them. So what we've been trying to do is really develop a strategy 
to defend ourselves. By way of so doing, we have to be strong enough, we have to stand out, and we have to be in alliance with the like-minded jurisdictions mm. in this region and beyond. Mm -hmm. So different countries have different national interests, as just pointed out. Some countries will try to strike a balance. Some, tr some countries, because of changing regime, they're leaning more towards the United States or the other way around. But, but, I, think, but I think in Taiwan, our national interests along with our strategy uh, is and should be very clear that uh, there, there is an authoritarian regime which is not democratic, uh, which uh, does not respect the basic human rights of its own people, uh, and using the new technologies to continue to have the full control of its people and, and try to use the ideologies and the technologies to, and they export them to around, to around the world and try to make it a China way. So our national interest along with the strategy should be very clear, at least to me, and uh, that, that this is, this is uh, in part of the like-minded countries where we try to defend ourselves against China. Mm -hmm. so, so on that note, on that note, I, th I think we're moving on, uh, we're on the right track. I think, uh, China never uh, renounces the use of force against Taiwan. So the threat to Taiwan is very, uh, uh, in some way, very uh, clear and even imminent. So everybody realized that. And I, I think the only thing that can change the balance of power in the region overnight is Taiwan falling into the hands of communists, Taiwan falling into the hands of China. So all the countries in the region realize that because they don't want to see that kind of big shift uh, in the uh, balance of power in the region. So all what all the democracies are doing now is trying to uh, to increase uh, their defense capability in the region to convince China that uh, they cannot use force against Taiwan mm -hmm. and they cannot change the status quo in the region. Okay, many people argue that in Taiwan we have strong semiconductor industries and we have a lot of advantage or strengths. Should should we asking to be included in these new allies? Uh, may it be Quad, Quad Plus, or further dialogue to have a further bounding toward international society, in your opinion? Well, we all know that China will react strongly if Taiwan is included in that kind of a security uh, framework. But I think we realize that Taiwan should not be left out uh, from this kind of security cooperation. So we have to come up with some sort of a, uh, we have to come to terms with a harsh reality that China will react strongly and that could uh, cause any troubles in the region right away. I think so. that's what we're good at, right? Because for the past 20 years, that's what Taiwan has been doing to strive for a space in international society. Do you think we're continuing on the right path? Well, absolutely. You know, we have to continue to engage in dialogues with other countries uh, in, in many ways, you know, sometimes very creative ways. For instance, uh, we have to engage in dialogues with other ruling parties in other countries. And for instance, I'm a director of the International Affairs Department at the DPP, the ruling party. We also engaged in regularized, institutionalized dialogue with our counterparts in Japan, LDP. So that's one way to bypass the difficulties we may be facing in terms of government-to-government -government dialogues. I want to look into the north of Taiwan Strait. So South Korea has now newly elected their new president, uh, Mr. Eun Soo Yo, to be the new president of South Korea. I'm very curious what is the new uh, government going to handle its relationship toward North Korea and furthermore to Taiwan? Well, I think first of all, we understand that the first priority issue for uh, South Korean government is North Korea. So uh, China policy, of North Korea, South Korea's China policy is a function of its uh, North Korean policy. And the U.S. is the uh, ally of South Korea. So that, with that uh, very important uh, alliance relationship, I think the U.S. and South Korea continue to strengthen their, their ties because it's very important to uh, South Korea's security. But obviously China has become a very important factor in terms of influencing uh, South, North Korea's policy towards so South Korea. So I think, uh, as we can see in the past few decades, uh, every South Korean government has been trying to balance the two major powers in its policy towards North Korea. And I think that kind of relationship is very difficult to balance. But in general, I would say uh, South Korean government, the new government, will continue to uh, strengthen its ties with the U.S. People will say he is relatively U.S. friendly. Is it good for Taiwan? 
Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, we are hoping that there will be uh, more uh, unity among all the traditional allies in the region. Uh, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, and the US. If we can have that kind of unity in the face of a rise in China or North Korean threats, I think we'll be more robust in terms of our relationship. Robust. It's such an interesting word, robust. Um, North Korea launching several missiles just recently, several months, we can see that, and trying to make a point. An ally with China, we all know that. What does it mean for a new administration to Taiwan? Well, the um, South Korea just elected its new president. It looks like it's switching gears a little bit. Um, looking forward, I think it's reasonably to expect that um, South Korea will have a better relationship with Japan. As you may know, that the, the, the relationship between uh, South Korea and Japan for the past years uh, hasn't been very good. But also with the United States. Uh, it makes sense for China to be on, the ner on its nerve a little bit. Uh, I understand that South uh, Korea will continue to strike a balance, but, the, but then you have a little bit of switching gears and then the change the dynamics a little bit towards mm. the, uh, the alliances um, uh, with the United States and Japan. So it is a positive uh, signal to Taiwan. Um, I, I understand that what, what the United States is being working hard on vis-a-vis -vis South Korea is to try to reshape its relationship, both political, economical, and also some technical, technological cooperations and, and sort of private sector or public to private uh, uh, cooperations, which in the past few years have been bumpy. And then and, and, um, a, a lot of people in the United States uh, have noticed that the relationship for the past few years between the United States and Taiwan uh, could even be better than the relationship between the United States and South Korea. But that, that might be just an observation, but mm. that speaks for itself. Now with the new regime, um, there, there might be a little bit uh, a, a difference. We'll, we'll, we'll continue to monitor the situation. Uh, but, but, but then, as you know, Kathleen, the, the regional geopolitic, geopolitics and geoeconomics is ever changing every day. Um, that, so the, 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 the Ukraine war, the, the Russian invasion on Ukraine has also changed the dynamics um, here and there a little bit in this region. So we'll continue to monitor very closely, monitor the situation on the new development of uh, South Korea's positioning, which I think in, in return will make a difference. I see. So far, we've touched upon the U.S. attitude toward Taiwan and other Asian countries' attitude toward Taiwan. My next question might be a little bit sensitive. It's about uh, the war in Ukraine, right? It brought a broader conversation about Taiwan's self defense awareness. People will argue if Taiwan, we don't have a, a holistic identity, a unified identity, how can we defend ourselves as a whole and to raise the uh, awareness of self-defense? Do you think, uh, as Taiwanese, we think about it more often than before after the war in Ukraine? Well, I, I think uh, Taiwan is no Ukraine, but one of the, one of the lessons that we learned from Ukraine and you, the people in Ukraine is that defending your country is not just the responsibility of the soldiers. It's on everyone's shoulder. We have, we have to defend ourselves when it comes to a war or, or a threat, in our case from China. You know, international communities would come to the rescue if and only if we stand up and defend ourselves. So we, we have to be prepared. We have every reason to try to avoid the war. We don't, we don't want to provoke um, any, not even the possibility of, you know, facing the war, but, but we have to be ready. We have to get ourselves ready. We have to revisit the current policies and we have to try to build up or strengthen the, uh, the, 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 the mindset of the people in Taiwan and, and try to have this mentality of getting ready to prepare to defend our dear country. And we have to demonstrate that to just, not just to ourselves, but also to the international community, so that people around the world will know that 
when it comes to a situation like this, hopefully it will not happen to us ever. But when it happens, if it happens, Taiwan people would, for no, no doubt about that, will stand up to defend ourselves. Mm -hmm. so, we, so international community will respect us and will come to uh, you know, support us in whatever ways, whatever possible ways that may be coming up. Just to add a note to that, I think Taiwan is not the only country that has been trying to learn lessons from the war in Ukraine, even for all European countries. You know, before the war uh, you know, uh, break up, I think many countries or even many leaders believed that uh, the war was unthinkable in Europe. But now it's possible and it's happening in Europe. And some countries have begun to rearm itself. So here in Taiwan, we have a similar uh, uh, lessons. In other words, as uh, Professor uh, Tan just mentioned, I think it's not just soldiers' work. It's everybody's uh, involved and it's very important for everybody to arm ourselves and prepare ourselves for any worst case scenario. Dr. Tang said getting ready. What do you think that means specifically? Means everyone should be enrolled in the army or specifically what does it mean you're in this National Defense Committee? I think uh, Taiwan used to have this kind of a, a, a mandatory military service for all men. But now uh, because of the uh, decision made by the previous government, we changed the policy into a volunteer uh, service system. And now people begin to talk about whether we should resume uh, the, uh, the, the you know, compulsory military service. What do you think? I think it's about time to talk about the issue. And I think it's a serious, serious issue that people uh, should engage in that discussion. And the government has decided that we are going to under uh, some sort of review of the current system. And after that kind of review, I think uh, the result will be showing that we uh, will tell the whole world that Taiwan is prepare ourselves for any possible war in the time of history. Let me just add on one thing real quick. I, I think in terms of the policy for, yes. for the mandatory military service, we have a very strong civil society. I like to see this issue as a bottom-up approach. In, oh. Instead of the lawmakers making the law and saying that we're going to change the law, we're, we're going to change the policy, we're going to require you know, all men now to serve for the military service to, to 12, 12 months. Yeah. I like to see that the civil society coming up to with, talk about with, with the momentum either, right? to talk about it and, and, and try to gear up to a, a way to defend our, our own country. So we have to get sufficient military training by ourselves, men and women included. And, and that's, the, that's the thing that I, I like to see. There are several uh, polls conducted, you know, asking people whether you believe that Taiwan uh, should resume this kind of mandatory military service. And the majority of people say yes. So that's a good sign, even among the young people. That's a great sign. They are in support of this kind of a, a mandatory military service. So, but again, engaging more dialogues with the civil society is very important uh, in terms of policy making. It is interesting, Dr. Lowe, you mentioned a uh, majority of the people uh, agree to resume military compulsory. I think because more or less, we have this fear, bear in mind, that in the near five years, there might be a military conflict in Taiwan Strait area. Do you agree? We have been receiving warnings uh, by military experts uh, in the States or even in Europe, suggesting that there will be a possible war in the Taiwan Strait in the near future. But, in what uh, time frame? Well, they said about five years, 10 years, and so on. But the thing is, we, have, we always have to prepare ourselves for the worst case scenario, whether it's happening tomorrow or five years from now. But obviously, uh, we are not going to engage in any you know, arms race in the region. We are hoping to maintain a credible deterrence in the Taiwan Strait by you know, strengthening or increasing our deterrence capabilities, by showing the world that we are going to fight uh, to the end of everything. So it's very important to show the will to fight and the capability to fight. Stephen, is a threat imminent? Um, I think uh, China has made it very clear that they want to take over Taiwan. So. You know, it could be any. It could be any minute. It could be any day. I, I don't want to predict that it's mm -hmm. this year, next year, five years. You know, the risk levels. Of course, there are some variety of assessments assessments on the likelihood. But again, I, I fully agree with Dr. Lo that we have to we have to mentally and physically get ready as a community, as a nation. You know, on whatever it takes basis. Um, whenever it happens or whatever it happens, we have to be ready. And then it takes a long process and on the continu the continuous basis. Mm. Uh, we, need to, we need to be ready, you know, on every minute. 
I, I don't I don't like to see that no this year is okay you know oh, we're gonna so we can just yeah just relax a bit back. and lay back and next year the risk is higher than the two year three year I I think it's it's a little bit uh, naive to to predict that because China is unpredictable you you can't you can't predict the China's Chinese leaders on how and when it gonna it, it's gonna take what actions so oh, I I, I think um, you know. Being a Taiwanese, I, I think we have to have this mentality that we have to come to our own defense in order to look upon the support internationally, which I think is critically important at this juncture and going forward. I think what Taiwan can do and should do is that to make sure that the leaders in Beijing, when they wake up in the morning and when they think about whether it's the, today is the day to launch a war in the Taiwan Strait, probably they will come to the conclusion is that not today. Not today, not but today. you don't know. So every day is not today for the leaders in Beijing. Yeah, I, I, li I like that expression. That's the deterrence. I, I think we have to have enough deterrent capability uh, to make Beijing, make sure that Beijing is going to say no to each and every day. Adding one more to that, China's uh, 20th Party Congress is coming right now. Do you think there's a shift uh, toward uh, the right now's administration, does it going to impact Taiwan in any way? I think uh, I always believe that there are three possible scenarios that could uh, lead to a war in the Taiwan Strait. One is that the leaders in Beijing is overconfident. They think that they can take over Taiwan overnight. So if leaders in Beijing feel that they're so secure, so confident that they can, you know, have a quick war, probably they will launch a war in the Taiwan Strait. That's scenario one. And scenario two is that uh, the, the leaders in Beijing feel so secure that they, their positions or their power is to be challenged domestically or externally, so they have no way to turn to but to you know, launch a war in the Taiwan Strait. That's another scenario. And the third scenario is that uh, any accidental conflicts in the Taiwan Strait escalating into an all-out war in the Taiwan Strait. Mm -hmm. So in any case, Taiwan has to prepare for the worst case scenario, but more importantly, you have to show that we have a credible deterrence in the Taiwan Strait to convince the leaders in, in Beijing that there won't be a quick war, and they, can even, they cannot even take over Taiwan in any, in any way. Just to av avoid three uh, scenarios as a whole, I see. Uh, do you agree, three scenarios, different plots? Uh, well, um, well, basically, yes. Um, I think political stability or instability within China or the CP CCP's internal politics uh, does play a critical role in, in the security and stability of the Taiwan Strait. Is it happening right now? Uh, it, 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 could, it, it, is, it is happening, it could happen. You know, uh, we're closely monitoring the situation, what's going on in Shanghai, mm -hmm. and in the next couple of months going forward until the party, the 20th Party Congress and CCP. I mean, a lot of developments you know, on a daily and weekly basis. Uh, it, the, the severe instability within CPP and also within the Chinese internal politics uh, will play a critical role on us or to the regional stability. Uh, it could happen, it could get worse, uh, but, but again, once again, there are so much things that, be, it, that is beyond con our control. What we can control is n to be not provocative, maintaining the status quo, preserving our rights and our privileges and also the, the, the way of life and, and to, to strengthen our positions in various different aspects as we talked about. Um, and this is, this is going forward, this is now and going forward with or without the political internal turmoil within the CPP and China, I, th I think we're gonna continue to do what we do. Thank you. Uh, that's a wrap up. Uh, thank you so much for your insights and input. We talked about the U.S. attitude. We talked about other Asian countries' attitude. And moving forward, we have to have this mentality to prepare to defend for ourselves. Thank you so much for watching. For more information, please download Taiwan Plus app. I'll see you next time.